hi, hello, how's it going? This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I'm your host, she who absolutely loves to cause herself grief when picking topics for the podcast, Liv. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Today's episode is a bit more grief, though considerably less than my attempts to explain the Orphic tradition to you all. Holy fucking fuck. The realm of Orpheus is confusing and hotly debated and, gods help me, difficult to explain in any kind of coherent and interesting way, let alone in a way that feels like I've covered everything that's important and that everyone debates and that scholars... Oh, I don't even, I don't even know. (laughs) What do you guys think of it? Interesting? Fascinating? Boring as fuck? Confusing as fuck? Well, love it or hate it, it's something that I've absolutely had to get to on the podcast at some point, and I did my best with what I have, which was a lot, perhaps too much, and certainly too many competing ideas and theories. Again, gods, help me. (laughs) But today, uh, today is a bit simpler, if considerably weirder. Today, we're talking about that wild and wacky idea of thrice-born Dionysus, Zagreus. The man, the myth, the legend, the main character of a popular video game that you all have been recommending to me countless times that I still have not played because I've been bitterly avoiding all things Orphic tradition. And now? Well, now I don't think I'm ready to get more Orphic tradition in my life. I'm going to need a breather before I dive back into that baffling realm. So let's talk myth once more. This mythical and deeply weird character of Zagreus. He and his story are really, truly, wildly something else. It might even be safe to say that there is no weirder or maybe even grosser origin story than that of Zagreus. Quick trigger warning in this one, it is particularly gross and egregious levels of, well, incest and assault. Yeah. This is episode 179. Finally, we're talking about Zagreus. Are you happy? The Orphic Thrice-Born Dionysus. Zagreus, Zagreus, Zagreus. What a name. What a mysterious character. Zagreus has origins in much, much earlier sources, which we will get to. But I wanted to start today's episode off by at least introducing the exciting stuff, the story itself, which is only found in any kind of detail in an epic poem called the Dionysiaca by a man named Nonus. Nonus was writing very, very late in the period, in the 5th century CE, and in Egypt, so we're talking about a thousand years after, say, the playwrights of classical Greece. A thousand years. So he's late. He's got some weird-ass stuff in that Dionysiaca, which is the longest surviving epic from ancient Greece, some of which I've told you before, specifically the story of Dionysus and Ampelus, But it's also work that I have a very extensive love-hate relationship with personally, because as an epic about Dionysus, it has a whole lot about my favorite couple, his grandparents, Cadmus and Harmonia. Regardless of all of this, it's where we get this story of Zagreus in any kind of full and explicit detail. And boy, is it a story. And to understand this story, you must suspend your Greek mythological imagination just a bit, as it will be turning upside down a lot of things that you think you know. Because as I always like to repeat, there are no hard and fast rules in Greek myth, no confirmed ideas or versions or sources. There is just what we have and how we interpret it. In this story, well, this story couldn't be a better example of this. Even I am having trouble wrapping my head around it, and I do this every moment of every day. (laughs) But before we dive too far into the madness that is my old friend and nemesis, Nonus, let's first 
go back a bit. Let's talk about the name Zagreus. Zagreus is an old name, that much we know. But his story as we know it in this epic by Nonus, called the Dionysiaca, is not so old at all, at least in the grand scheme of Greek mythology. Like I said, it's about 1500 years old from now. And that is an absolute baby when it comes to Greek myth. The name Zagreus first appeared, as far as we know, in the lost epic called the Alcmionis. That epic would have been part of the Theban cycle, the series of epic poems that told the story of the Seven Against Thebes. We know that story now from a few surviving places, plays like Aeschylus' Seven Against Thebes and Euripides' Phoenician Women, among others, or the Roman epic called the Thebiad, which may have been, in part, based on some of those epic poems that we no longer have. Quite coincidentally, I had hoped to dive into the Thebiad soon, but it ends up being so much longer and too epic for right now. We'll get there later, though. For now, we know that this name Zagreus appeared there and in a handful of other places that I'll mention later, but we don't know if there was necessarily any connection to the Zagreus that we will learn from this late myth, from the Orphic tradition, most notably the Dionysiaca. The Zagreus of the Lost Epic was a powerful god, that much we know, he was apparently even paired up with Gaia in some way. That's how powerful. Meanwhile, in other surviving sources, there's a fragment of Aeschylus, a reference to a character named Zagreus, who was, indeed, associated with the underworld and possibly even Hades' son, or separately, he could have just been equated with Hades himself in a different fragment. My beloved Euripides, too, mentions Zagreus in his lost play of the Cretes, which we'll get into later. Further down the timeline, we have Callimachus, a poet writing in the Hellenistic period, so a couple hundred years after Euripides. He refers specifically to the birth of Dionysus Zagreus, which is even more directly making this connection between the two characters, a connection that is explicit in what we know of from the Orphic mythology. The best part of all of this, Orphic sources, actual surviving literature that we know to be Orphic in nature, barely use the name Zagreus at all. It's not not there, but it's not there a ton. Like I said, it's all supremely fucking confusing, which is why it took me five years of podcasting Greek myth to even attempt it, and still I feel like I've gotten myself in much, much too deep. But we're powering through because Nonus is at least making this vaguely easier for me. We're jumping in to the Dionysiaca of Nonus in Book 5. The city of Thebes has already been founded by my beloved Cadmus and Harmonia, and they've already had their children, Autonoe, Aino, Agawe, Semele, and Polydorus. Semele, though, is not exactly the mother of Dionysus in the way we usually see her. Or not yet. She's introduced with the line, quote, Semele was kept for a more brilliant union, for already Zeus ruling on high intended to make a new Dionysus grow up, a bull-shaped copy of the older Dionysus, since he thought with regret of the ill-fated Zagreus. What does that mean? Dionysus already exists, but also he doesn't, or rather he's dead. <sighs> Nonus's narrative structure sometimes leaves something to be desired. We shall power through this confusing as all fuck introduction to Semele and even Dionysus himself by continuing on and just letting it get weirder and weirder. Fortunately, the weirdness does, kind of, explain the Dionysus situation eventually. This child that Zeus is mourning, the name I've already had the pleasure of saying to you countless times in today's episode, Zagreus, we now learn, was a son born to Zeus and Persephone. Yes, father and daughter. It's an Orphic thing. Zagreus was a son born to Zeus and Persephone in, quote, the dragon bed. You see, Zeus transformed himself into a snake. A dragon, as these are often called in the ancient Greek, where the word dragon comes from. And in this form of a snake, he snuck up upon Persephone, his daughter, quote, as a gentle dragon twining around her lovely curves. And there, we learned very specifically, he not only assaulted her, but he took her virginity. 
Now, this is a translation I'm reading, and frankly, I've never found another translation of this text in all my searching, so I can't say for certain the intention, be it explicit assault or implied, or whether it really is about virginity in the modern sense. Still, regardless of all of these connotations, it's pretty weird and pretty gross, and I think we can all agree on that. It is also clear in this text that while Persephone is the quote-unquote consort of Hades, she is currently unwedded. There's a suggestion that they will marry, but they haven't yet. But that is Nonus getting ahead of himself, speaking of things that are still to come. He pulls us back in time, and right now, Persephone is wanted by everyone. You see, it seems there was this time in this version of things, that is, where Persephone was wanted by every man on Olympus. She was so sought after by all of the gods that they'd offered her gifts, and impressive ones too. Hermes had offered his caduceus staff, Apollo had offered his lyre, Ares' his spear and cuirass and a shield specifically for Persephone. Hephaestus brought her a necklace, freshly created and shimmering with color. But no one wanted her as badly as Zeus did. I can't keep repeating their familial relationship. I just can't. We're going to try to leave it behind. Zeus wanted her so badly, and this epic poem describes it in such great detail, just how badly he wanted her, just how he handled that desire. And if I had to read this, you all have to hear it too. In this quote, I'm adjusting some of the epithets of the gods so that you know who I'm talking about. Quote, But she could not escape the all-seeing eye of Zeus. He gazed at the whole body of Persephone uncovered in her bath. Not so wild his desire had been even for Aphrodite. When craving but not attaining... He scattered his seed on the ground and shot out the hot foam of love, self-sown. And don't worry, it goes on a couple lines later, quote, He left the house of Hera, he refused the bed of Dion, he threw away the love of Demeter, he fled from Thamus, he deserted Leto, no charm was left for him but only in union with Persephone. Even for Zeus, this is just, it's so much ick, so much gross. For now, though, it seems, because Nonus doesn't love to be clear in his words or time, Zeus has only just masturbated while he watched Persephone bathe. The rest is still to come. The snake situation, that is. And it's moments like this that you can really tell how late Nonus is writing, how different this epic is from those that come from the tradition of oral storytelling. Nonus is writing a narrative in the way we think of them now. Kind of confusingly, but he is. He's using tropes and foreshadowing, he's jumping around in his timeline, he's writing extensive and deeply disturbing scenes just to really set things up. Are we supposed to think it's horrifying how Zeus is behaving? I mean, probably not. This is all in the lead up to a birth of an incredibly important god, and this whole work is all about Dionysus, who is also this god. It's just really fucking gross to our modern sensibilities. You know, the sensibilities that don't love father-daughter incest and creepy old men masturbating while watching young women bathe. Man, we're just such prudes now, right? Anyway, we've got back into the story those to those moments when everyone wants Persephone. When all of the men of Olympus are trying to woo her. Bring your mind back to that point. To give her gifts that would convince her to pick them. Persephone, for her part, really doesn't have any words in this section. We don't know how she feels, which is, of course, a bit of a running theme in Persephone in general when she's not in the underworld. Everything is through the lens of her mother. And boy, is her mother not into these attentions by the gods of Olympus. And I know a lot of people would call Demeter overbearing here, but I think I'm just too deep into the actions of the men on Olympus, and all I can see is a mother who knows when her daughter needs protecting. These dudes are basically all predators, after all. Who do you think I'm going to anger by saying that? Will I get an email? 
Time will tell. Demeter goes in search of a solution to her problem, to this threat to Persephone. She visits a man named Astraeus, called here the god of prophecy. And this is a late interpretation, and possibly an Orphic one too. But either way, don't go worrying about your confusion at him being a god of prophecy. This is a one-off. He is, however, always the god of stars and astrology, and that's relevant here too. Regardless, it's necessary for the story that he is related to prophecy, and Demeter goes to him. She tells him what's going on. Astraeus first t tries to distract her, to alleviate her concerns. He and his family, the winds and other gods, throw her a feast. An epic feast. And they dance and sing until it's late. And Demeter's mind finally clears, letting her remember why it is that she's there in the first place. She needs help. She wants Astraeus to tell her what is going to happen with Persephone. She wants a comforting oracle. She wants to be reassured. So Astraea sets about determining this. And again, because this is so late in the ancient world, he uses this now established zodiac and astrology to determine Persephone's future. It's beautifully described here too, and very similar to how we see things even today. Quote, he learnt the details of the day when her only child was newborn and the exact time and veritable course of the season which gave her birth. Then he bent the turning fingers of his hands and measured the moving circle of the ever-recurring number counting from hand to hand in double exchange. Then he pulls out a sphere, quote, the shape of the sky, the image of the universe, and laid it upon the lid of a chest. He continues like this, sorting out all of the necessary information to determine her zodiac chart, or whatever it's called, honestly, I don't know anything about this stuff except that I'm a Cancer. Still, it's fascinating here to see it all described in the ancient world. He looks at everything so closely, mapping out the planets and the moon, he goes through all the astrological motions, and he sees all her possible suitors there in the stars. And finally, he finds Zeus. He tells Demeter that it may still be possible for her to affect the fates, to sway them to her side, to change the outcome, but that he sees a, quote, secret bedfellow come unforeseen. Ooh. He tries to reassure her, telling her that she will become famous herself after it all for bestowing all the fruits upon the barren soil. It seems to me he's also foreseeing Persephone's eventual marriage to Hades here, but honestly, it's really difficult to figure out any kind of timeline that Nonus is working off of. Still, while Hades was mentioned as her consort, it does seem like this is before she marries him. For all I tell you to ignore continuity issues, the fact that Persephone and Hades are the king and queen of the underworld together is a pretty strong constant across the sourcing and time periods, which is why I'm trying to figure it out. But in this origin story, this Orphic origin, there are things that must happen before she ends up with Hades. Demeter is torn with how she feels about this news. She's happy to hear of her own future as the mother of grain, how she will bring the fruits of the earth back to it. But for now, she's worried about Persephone, particularly someone coming in secret, uninvited, to have sex with Persephone. The word used in this translation, too, is ravish, which is a very kind and patriarchal way to say rape. The context is clear. But Demeter will do all she can to stop this, so she goes home and she yokes a few snakes to a chariot and sets out. Yes, her chariot is being pulled by snakes, because this is a very, very Eleusinian Demeter. This is a late period Demeter who is already deeply associated with snakes and the earth. Plus, it is incredibly, wonderfully cool to imagine a chariot drawn by snakes. So with her chariot drawn by snakes, she brings Persephone all the way to Sicily, where she finds a cave where she can hide her daughter. Again, we know nothing of Persephone's thoughts and feelings here, which is very Demeter, very similar to the story of Hades and Persephone. Still, this is Zeus, who we're concerned with, who's coming for Persephone, and, and, and not only that, but he's her father. So I think we can really feel for Demeter's actions here. And so, in this roundabout way, it's in this very cave where Demeter brings Persephone to hide 
a, her away to prevent this from happening where it all takes place, where we circle back around to that moment at the beginning of the episode where Zeus comes to Persephone in the cave in the form of a snake, where he curls around her limbs, licking at her with his forked tongue. And that is where she becomes pregnant with the child that they will call Zagreus, a child born with horns who, quote, by himself climbed upon the heavenly throne of Zeus and brandished lightning in his little hand and newly born, lifted and carried the thunderbolts in his tender fingers. It is only in the Orphic tradition that Persephone has any children at all, and Zagreus is far and away the most important one. He is such a unique and odd character, something we can gather from the very first moments that he's even alive. This baby climbs on Zeus's throne and takes hold of his thunderbolt, his lightning. This is symbolic as all hell. This is a child who will rival Zeus in his power. But first he has to go through some shit. Hera, we're told, finds out about this new child of Zeus, and in her usual way, she sets out to exact punishment. But unlike anything else Hera has ever done, this one involves the Titans. Again, remember how late the story is coming from, 5th century CE. That means it's about, again, a thousand years from someone like Aeschylus. But it's also written from the perspective of this Orphic tradition, or at least with the knowledge of it, which had really taken hold by that period. Its height seems to have been in late antiquity, in the Hellenistic period and even into the Roman. So this is just a whole other world of mythology than the one I usually share with you. It just happens to feature the same gods. I say that because the Titans. The Titans are brought in to punish Zagreus, or rather punish Zeus by coming for Zagreus. They disguise themselves, painting their faces with white chalk, and while the baby looks at himself in the mirror, apparently contemplating his ability to transform himself, the fact that he is a changeling, while he does this, they come at him with an infernal knife. And with that knife, they not only stab him, but they cut him up into little pieces, deliberately dismembering this baby. But he does not die. He becomes something so far beyond death, something unfathomable, something not seen anywhere else in Greek myth. You have to hear it all directly, too, so this is a long but amazing quote. There, where his limbs had been cut piecemeal by the titan steel, the end of his life was the beginning of a new life as Dionysus. He appeared in another shape and changed into many forms, now young, like crafty Zeus shaking the Aegis cape, now as ancient Kronos, heavy need pouring rain. Sometimes he was a curiously formed baby, sometimes like a mad youth with the flower of the first down marking his rounded chin with black. Again, a mimic lion. He uttered a horrible roar in furious rage from a wild, snarling throat as he lifted a neck shadowed by a thick mane, marking his body on both sides with the self-striking whip of a tail which flickered about over his hairy back. Next, he left the shape of a lion's looks and let out a ringing neigh, now like an unbroken horse that lifts his neck on high to shake out the imperious tooth of the bit, and rubbing, whitened his cheek with hoary foam. Sometimes he poured out a whistling hiss from his mouth, a curling horned serpent covered with scales, darting out his tongue from his gaping throat and leaping upon the grim head of some titan, encircled his neck in snaky spiral coils. 
Then he left the shape of the restless crawler and became a tiger with gay stripes on his body, or again like a bull emitting a counterfeit roar from his mouth, he butted the titans with sharp horn. Yeah. It is really something. This baby, Zagreus, torn to shreds by the Titans themselves, is reborn as Dionysus, but not the Dionysus we're used to. This one is special. He's the Orphic Dionysus, and he can transform into anything. He transforms and transforms, and ultimately he proves a worthy opponent to the Titans as he fought for his life. But in the end, though, they are too much for him, and the Titans once again kill this Dionysus. As he existed in the shape of a bull, and they cut him into little pieces for the second time. Things are not going well for baby Zagreus. With his new child now killed twice, both as a baby Zagreus and as Dionysus, Zeus is feeling a bit, well, angry. That is an understatement, yes. He absolutely lays waste to the Titans, just kicks their asses within moments, and he imprisons them in that Tartarian pit that we know so well. But he's so angry that he continues to kind of just shower his wrath over everything, to the point where Gaia, Earth, is on fire in so many places, and she's just begging for his mercy. So finally, the gods get through to him and he stops his rampaging, but the fires are still burning. So in order to soothe Mother Gaia, Zeus sets out to send a flood. And, well, this is a totally alternate flood deluge myth that I do not have time to get into because, again, Nonus is an incredibly, sometimes mind-numbingly wordy dude, and this episode is about thrice-born Dionysus, Zagreus. We've only had two births so far, so let's just skip ahead, shall we? Eventually, the story continues on as we know it. Zeus begins a relationship with the mortal woman, the daughter of Cadmus and Harmonia, Semele. Semele, it seems, really loves Zeus and falls for him hard. I won't rehash their entire story in full detail again because I've told it before and it's just sad, but the gist is that, of course, Hera finds out about Semele and Zeus's relationship. She disguises herself as an old woman, speaking with Semele and convincing her to ask to see Zeus in his true form. He had told her that he was a god, that he was Zeus, that much she knew, but he hadn't shown himself in his true form. At Hera's urging, Semele asked Zeus to see it, and he showed her. When she looked at him in this form, this godliest form, she died. Instantly. But she was already pregnant with a child, and Zeus took the baby from her womb, sewing it all up in his thigh before he was grown enough to be born again. And that baby was Dionysus. That is always the story of Dionysus' birth, that he is the son of a mortal woman and Zeus, that he is the only god that is the son of a mortal, let alone the only Olympian who has that status. And there is so much more to his story in general that I haven't ever even gotten to, and so, so much of it in this work by Nonus. But today is about Zagreus, and that's where this version is unique. Zagreus is Dionysus, but Dionysus is not Zagreus. Zagreus is... gods, he's interesting. So as I said at the beginning of the episode, this name, Zagreus, does appear in older sources like Aeschylus and Euripides. That places the name at least as far back as like the 5th or the 6th centuries. But what we know of it from back then doesn't necessarily confirm it's the same Zagreus of the Orphic tradition, or rather the same Zagreus that's also Dionysus. Let's look at the evidence, shall we? I do love evidence and sourcing. So we've got Zagreus in that lost epic, the Alcmeonis, and we've got him in two different fragments of Aeschylus. The first is the lost play Sisyphus, where Zagreus is a chthonic deity of the underworld and is possibly even described as Hades' son. 
In fact, Hades is described as his sire in this fragment, but it's open to interpretation whether this is saying that he's like literally Hades' child or if this is a connection through Zagreus' real mother, Hades' wife, Persephone. And finally, again, in Aeschylus, his lost play, Egyptoi, Zagreus is possibly even described as Hades himself. Then we can compare that to a generation later, when he appears in Euripides' lost play, The Cretes, where a chorus of Cretan mystae, quote, of night-wandering Zagreus, celebrating the feasts of raw flesh, where they acquire the title of Bacchus, which is, as you well know, another name, sometimes a cult name, of Dionysus. Interesting, though, to me, is this reference to eating raw flesh, because one other thing I've seen referenced in some writings on Orphism is this, the idea that they actually avoided the flesh of animals entirely. It doesn't seem to be super well fleshed out in sources I've found, and isn't referenced a lot of times except, like, in Wikipedia, so who knows? But it stood out because this is sort of exactly the opposite of that. And then, by the time we reach the Hellenistic poet, Callimachus, another couple hundred years later, Dionysus is this explicitly linked character with Zagreus, the latter name being explicitly the child of Zeus and Persephone in Callimachus. So, either from the beginning or somewhere along the line, this ancient name became associated with the god Dionysus, and then further down the line became more explicitly a reborn Dionysus, a child of Zeus and Persephone, a kind of alternate Dionysus altogether, both connected with and separate from the one that we know from the more traditional mythological sources. Still more interesting to me is this connection between Zagreus and the Orphic tradition altogether. While Zagreus is usually labeled as the god at the center of the tradition, and Orphism, if Orphism as a kind of cult of worship did exist, the actual sourcing does not make that explicit. He is a character in many of the fragments of Orphic poetry, but there isn't any kind of explicit labeling him as more important than, say, Zeus, who is arguably more prominent in the Orphic poetry than he is in the traditional Greek myths. Often the idea of Zagreus becomes overblown due to the Christianization of that story, this rebirth after death, and notably the ideas of original sin that were placed on that story after the fact, everything I talked about last week. And where does the original sin idea come in, you might ask? Well, this is Nonus's version that I've just told you because it's the most complete and detailed, but other fragmentary sources that are more specifically Orphic in nature include, yes, more swallowing. The Titans actually swallow the pieces of the baby Zagreus, and so he is kind of born anew from the Titans as well, which is supposed to be where the idea of sin comes in, because the Titans are by nature bad? I'm probably not making this very convincing, and that's because it, it, it isn't very convincing. One has to read it with a Christian idea of original sin in mind in order to put it into this story. Because the hymns, which we'll talk about more next week, alongside other surviving fragments, specifically the variations on the birth and death of Zagreus, because these come from a time either just before or at the beginnings of Christianity, this link is often made by the people talking about the Orphic tradition even in antiquity and later as well. It just kind of carries down the line. And then it all gets overblown. Now, some of this is my interpretation, having read all of this, and some of this is found in scholarly articles, namely by someone named Radcliffe Edmonds. You can find links in the episode's description. Still, it adds an interesting layer and opens up a lot of questions about how we interpret these stories, what weight we place on certain aspects, and what kind of biases might be contributing to that. I'm not saying that Zagreus wasn't at the center of the Orphic tradition or the religion, if it was a distinct religion in any sense, but there are definitely valid questions that can be asked based on the surviving sources. So why not ask them? Phew. Well, next week, more on Orphic poetry and the ideas found within the surviving fragments and hymns, a little bit more Zagreus, and specifically, what else makes them so unique compared to the earlier, more well-known Greek myths? Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. As always, thank you so much for listening. As I've said, diving into this 
this Orphic tradition was even more difficult than I expected. And honestly, I already expected it to be very, very difficult and confusing. That's why I've openly put it off for this long. Made a joke out of it, even. That's why I give you all the absolute non-answers when you ask questions about Zagreus, or even that other name that sometimes comes up, Baubo. We haven't even gotten to her yet, and that's for next week. But now, finally, you have the story of Zagreus, so when you next play that game, Hades, you'll have a bit more to go off of. How is he connected with the Underworld, other than Persephone? Ha, huh, haven't even gotten there yet. And well, that's also confusing. Surprise, surprise. I do hope you've enjoyed these episodes on the Orphic Tradition, and next week's as well. I realized last week's was quite different from the usual show because it's really just me attempting to understand this wildly fragmentary, contradictory, and generally confusing tradition, let alone then try to explain it all to you. But I do think it's incredibly fascinating to try to wrap one's head around all of those fragments, those contradictions, and all the open questions about what the Orphic tradition was, what Orphism was, if Orphism was anything at all, and just everything surrounding all of that. It really adds a complexity to the ancient world and reminds us all that these were real people just living their lives, worshipping gods, being initiated into mystery cults, performing rituals for whatever reason. These aren't just stories, but real life, and they have real life implications that we can never fully understand, because there was no one just recording everything that was going on. They didn't imagine a world 2,000 or more years later where some nerd with a microphone and a bunch of confusing academic books would be trying to explain all of this to thousands of strangers on the internet. Again, I mean, it's kind of rude that they didn't imagine such a world, but I guess I can't blame them. Next week, the final episode on all things Orphic, the Rhapsodies, the alternate Theogonies, the Hymns, Baobo, and more. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things. Specifically, Michaela did a ton of research on the Orphic tradition for me, including using her university access to help me get things that I wouldn't otherwise have. Huge, huge thank you to Michaela for all her work. But namely on Orphic everything. Whew. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. I am Liv and I love this shit, even if the Orphic tradition is trying its hardest to break my mind. Damn you, Zagreus. Mm -hmm.